Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming today. I wanted to introduce today's speaker, and that's Dr. Paul Bologna. Some of you know Paul because he was a student here at one time and uh, graduated in 1998. And for me, this is kind of an interesting week because I had my last student do her defense on Monday, Alex Rodriguez. And Paul was the first student that I graduated in the Department of Marine Sciences back in 1998. So kind of a, you know, a, a memorial weekend for me. Um, so I, I wanted you to, to see what Paul looked like back when he was a student. That's up, him up on the, the far left there, the second from the left. A couple of other cohorts there, just when we were opening the estuarium. Uh, what we, we had is the old estuary. I mean, you can see Paul in the middle there, too, uh, as he looks more, more like uh, today. So let's see. If, if I can figure out how to work the slide thing. Okay, went back one. Yeah, so a bit about Paul's background. So he got his bachelor's degree at Miss, uh, Michigan State University. Uh, 1988. He then worked in Alaska for a while before entering the master's program at University of Maine. And there he worked on lobsters with Bob Stenick. And John Valentine and I actually met Paul at University of Maine. We had a field marine science class that we brought up to Maine, and he was there at the time. So we, we shared a few beers with him in the evenings, and eventually uh, Paul got in touch again and wound up coming down here to work on his PhD. Uh, which he finished in 98, as I said. You can see he worked on seagrass here. Uh, after he left the lab here, he uh, took a postdoc at Rutgers University working with Ken Abel there and uh, also continued his work on seagrasses while at Rutgers. Uh, he then moved on to a faculty position at Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey, also known sometimes as Fairly Ridiculous University, I have to say that. Uh, he stayed there a few years and then moved on to Montclair State University where he's been uh, since, uh, rising through the ranks from assistant to associate to now full professor. And at Montclair, he's director of their uh, aquatic and coastal sciences program. So Paul's published a, a number of papers on a wide variety of topics. He started out working on seagrass, and I think when he was a student here, published four or five papers, which sort of carried me for a while. While, while he was here, and then, then I relied on Brad Peterson to do the same thing after that. Uh, but he's moved to, on to, to work in other habitats, coral reefs, and most recently working in planktonic systems with invasive species, and you'll hear some of that today. Uh, Paul came here with a lot of talents. We didn't know some of them. He's quite a dancer. You can see him busting a move there on the left, uh, one of the Benthic Ecology meetings, and, and dancing with Valentine on the right. One of the few times you'll ever see Valentine on the dance floor, and that, that's a good thing. Paul also dances horizontally. You can see him over there on the other side. And he has some, some talents. You see him up on the bandstand there with the tambourine. So we usually try to show embarrassing pictures. Uh, these are the only ones that I could show in this kind of audience. There are a number of others that we may show later on. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Paul now and let, let him do his thing. Is this one on? You guys can hear me now? Okay. Okay, so uh, like Ken said, um, he didn't give you all the details on some of the things. So in fact, when I first met Ken and John when they came up to Maine where I was doing my master's, all I knew was that there were these assholes from Alabama who came and were just totally trashing the field station and I had to wash their dishes if I wanted to eat and I was not a real happy camper and there was always at least a half gallon of vodka sitting on the table when we had our little chats in the evening. Um, so John and Ken were a little bit lit and I, I didn't know who they were. I was a young master student and it wasn't until I started to work on my thesis that I'm like, oh my god, heck and worth, heck and... Uh, Heckin' James, Heckin' Weinstein, oh my, I just pissed off somebody who's really important in my field. Um, but that actually led to the next time I saw Ken at the Benthic meetings, we actually had a really great conversation, and it ultimately led me uh, down here. Um, so you can see, uh, in our younger days, uh, Ken and I at the Wonder Bar, and then later on at the Benthic meetings that were held down. Um, 
here. Um, first and foremost, I don't do all this work all myself. I, it, it's a complete lie. And so the two people at the top, uh, Jack Gaynor and, and Rob Meredith, are faculty members in the biology department. They're kind of my molecular cohorts that really help me out there. And then um, most of this work, in all honesty, in a lot of respects, is not going to happen without that young lady. That's my PhD student, Dina Restaino, who's just finishing up right now, who's really sort of a, one of the molecular whizzes that makes my life so much easier to deal with. Um, We've had probably, you know, close to 50, 60 students uh, in the last five or six years working on a lot of our projects going through. And uh, the state of New Jersey has been really good in terms of supporting our funding. Um, so, you know, the, the question is, is, how do you get from working in seagrasses to sort of working in jellyfish? Um, and it's, it's surprisingly not that difficult to get from, um, where is the laser pointer? This one? It's not really hard to get from here over to there um, if you think about things in, in slightly different fashions. So, you know, I started working with Ken and seagrasses, and I still do seagrasses, both up in New Jersey and I work down in, in the Virgin Islands as well. But in, in 2010, I had a graduate student that was kind of interested in this emerging problem, which is uh, these sea nettles, which are right here. These are scyphozoans. This is the adult stage, Medusa, that we're used to. And this is sort of the benthic polyp. So I, I remain to be a benthic ecologist, um, but, but just asking slightly different questions. And the, the problem is, is that these guys right here really cause problems for swimmers and aggregations. And in some cases, their densities can be upwards of 30 or 40 per cubic meter. So if you're trying to swim in the back bays and whatnot, you're absolutely going to get stung by these things. Um, and so uh, our classical New Jersey shore used to be, and if you've ever been there during the summer, uh, greenheads, which are these big-ass biting flies that are absolutely incredible um, and voracious. Uh, and so the only respite we used to get from um, greenheads was to go swimming in the lagoons and in the water um, and then all of a sudden we start to see this phase shift where uh, these jellyfish are really abundant. And so um, that started me uh, asking questions about these guys and sort of the, the, the roles that they might play. Um, like most systems, there's lots of different types of what we call jellyfish, and there's a lot of misnomers. So scyphozoans, siphonophores, hydrozoans, and, and comb jellies are sort of those broad categories, um, some of which are stinging. Um, so any of the sort of the true cnidarians have stinging cells, and some of them can be extremely venomous. Uh, comb jellies are not. They're nice, but, you know, we have this problem all the time where people talk and tell us about these really terrible jellyfish problems they have, and they've got comb jellies, and they're worried about, you can pick them up, you can eat them, they're not going to hurt you um, along those lines. But under both cases, um, whether or not they're comb jellies or sort of true jellies, uh, these are absolutely voracious predators within the system, and they've been linked to fisheries declines and fisheries losses on a global basis when these blooms happen. Specifically because some of the things that they really focus on are components... Uh, this is a very, very small jelly eating a larval fish. So even at their smallest stage, they are really taking down sort of the l egg and larval stage of fishes, um, and they don't allow them to kind of move through the system. So they start to shunt the energy that might have gone to higher trophic levels into sort of what we call the jelly loop. And so... Um, I got involved with this project, and, and specifically as this population of jellies grew more and more, we started to have to really address the question, is that uh, when we look at sort of life history of a, a typical jellyfish, yes, we've got this uh, adult stage, which is what we consider, but this little part here, this polyp stage, is really critical for the life history. In particular, because this is one of the places that they show huge quantities of asexual reproduction. These things clone themselves like crazy. As long as they've got food, they're just cloning and making more and more and more of themselves. And what that means is that it doesn't matter how many adults you can control, if you don't address the problem of where these polyps are, there's just going to be as many as there were last year, if not more. So there's a lot of effort now at trying to address the question of, okay, well, where are these polyps and, and what's actually happening? And so um, I, I show this picture all the time when we talk about these issues is that, you know, we don't really have a jellyfish problem. We have a polyp problem and that we've really made it extremely accessible for polyps to go through. So um, if you don't understand, so these are polyps hanging down. This little stack, those are little individual jellyfish ready to bud off from that single polyp. So just to give you kind of a scale, um, for, for some species, a single recruiting polyp by the end of the season can have cloned itself 10 to 15 times. Um, that following year, um, those 10 to 15, again, can clone themselves 
10 to 15 times, so you're looking at you know 100 polyps, uh, each of which are capable of producing anywhere between 5 and 35 little jellies. So a single polyp the following season can result anywhere between you know 500 and 5,000 jellies in a region. So this is where that population structure really can take a, a, an issue. So these are some of the questions that we were starting to look at. Um, so in New Jersey, we've got a, a variety of, of uh, true jellies, um, uh, and you've got most of these in these areas, including our occasional neighbors, things like box jellies that show up along our shores and cause us a lot of craziness. Um, this is actually a hydrozoan. This is called a quora. Um, this is a really fascinating one because this is where we get GFP or green fluorescent protein. So if you've ever looked at DNA or, or molecules or uh, having to deal with biomedical research, this is the thing that we actually use uh, to, to tag onto those parts. So we've got a lot of different species that uh, are present in the New Jersey area and, and beyond. Um, including uh, Portuguese man of war. Now these are not sort of locals that we get. Uh, we can thank you guys here in the tropics and subtropics for all of these. But they go riding up the Gulf Stream and come in really high quantities during the summer along our beaches. And when they wash up onto the shore, people get stung by them just hanging loose. Um, these will follow all the way up into uh, northern Europe. So for the last two years, they have been trucking across the Atlantic Ocean and the beaches of the Great Britain and up that area have just been dogged by Portuguese man of war. So you don't te technically think that you would ever see Portuguese man of war that far north. They're just riding the Gulf Stream along. So the Gulf Stream brings them up from the tropics into our areas. So this is one of my favorites. This is actually from Honduras and mangroves where I was working, but um, as close as I'm willing to get to them in the field because it was sort of stuck inside there. Um, and then lastly, these comb jellies. Um, and, and these can be extremely uh, abundant in, in any area. Um, and the introduction, this is uh, Nemeopsis lydii uh, right here. Um, it's been introduced into the Black Sea, into the Mediterranean. It's gone up into uh, the North Atlantic. And generally, wherever it tends to invade, um, it becomes one of the dominant apex predators and it really wipes out fisheries and fish eggs and, and fish larvae. They're just incredibly voracious predators. So these things are, are sort of spreading and that's really where I started to get into some of the questions that I look at. And in particular, uh, there's a lot of controversy as, as to whether or not there's really more jellyfish now than there ever were. We certainly know that there's uh, lots and lots of evidence that jellyfish have bloomed in the past, and so it's part of their life history. But realistically, when we look at some of the problems that are really a direct result of us, it's the things like you know degraded water quality affiliated with excess nutrients coming into the system. It's the excess quantity of artificial structure that is now out there. Um, when I was here, I don't remember that oil rig, like. 300 yards offshore here. <laughs> it wasn't there. So the amount of hard structure that we've actually put forward is really uh, immense. And then um, the other components are we've really changed shoreline modification in terms of hardening shorelines, adding structure, and sort of changing. And these all are sort of give certain types of advantages because they uh, allow more habitat for polyps to survive. And so uh, I'm, I'm really sort of a community ecologist. So a benthic seagrass community, pelagic community. I ask the same kinds of questions. Um, so the first is that when we start to look at Barnegat Bay, which is where I work in, this sea nettle became sort of an apex, a big time pro predator within the system. And so the state was really interested in trying to understand its dynamics. Um, at the same point, we had a small storm called Hurricane Sandy, and it's really allowed us to take a look at sort of what were the impacts of this hurricane on the community structures that were out there. And also trying to work to see, do we see recovery, resilience of these post that particularly large storm. So just to kind of give you a feeling, this is uh, Ocean County in Barnegat Bay, and you can kind of look at the, the, the different trends. So back in the 70s, in this region, oh, we still have a tremendous amount of uh, forest and all the rest of this. And then, you know, uh, fast forward uh, 50 years, and these are incredible dense developments of, of people living alongside there, along with all of the other uh, sources, impervious surfaces, so you're increasing runoff, nutrients, all these other factors that really sort of uh, negatively impact our coastal areas. Um, one area that I was very interested in, in addressing is this concept of sort of hardening our shorelines. So um, we did a lot of sort of marsh conversion, you know, from what we had was a nice salt marsh into now a community um, where we're sort of maximizing the number of people who have waterfront development. You can imagine 
changes in water quality if you live back in here how much tidal flushing that you're going to end up having not a whole lot so a lot of these places in that ensuing period have really seen a lot of really nasty degradation of water quality so you know those are some of the problems then what do we do well we start replacing things like creosote and all this nasty stuff with um, vinyl bulkheading and steel bulkheading and concrete to sort of make it nice what ends up happening then is you just have increased the quantity of available space for these polyps to grow. And with a really degraded water quality, nobody else can live there. You know, barnacles land and they all die because there's no oxygen within the system. But jellyfish essentially aren't really daunted by really uh, almost hypoxic conditions. To, you know, they can survive extended periods of less than two milligrams per liter um, for days. For days they can survive under those conditions. Most organisms uh, really don't. So they basically have no competitors for those areas and they can just clone themselves and that's, that's what we end up seeing. Um, so the, the first set of these research objectives that I was working on were to try to figure out, okay, well, what is the characterization of these gelatinous zooplankton? We have little to no data actually within the bay um, and certainly we've seen theoretical shifts over the last decade with the advent of these guys. Um, and then uh, some of the others are trying to assess, well, what are the potential impacts? We know that jellyfish have really big impacts in terms of food web structure. So what are they doing there? And then lastly, part of this big project is what were the impacts of, of Hurricane Sandy? Now, it might be really difficult to see. This is sort of a, uh, uh, one of the jellies that's uh, being held out there. This is actually a big goby, and it's surrounded by one of these sea nettles. He's actually in his guts. Inside here, if you can see all of those little specks, those are all little teeny jellies out there. So the densities of some of these things can be incredibly high. So, you know, quick methods sampled the hell out of the bay for three years to try to make these assessments and look at our, our, our validation and changes over time. And Part of the evidence of us trying to look at this is, well, where else are these species really common? So in the Chesapeake Bay, we end up with this same uh, Chrysara, the sea nettle, and within the Chesapeake Bay, we see this really nice trophic cascade. That when you compare sort of the two big species, so Chrysara and Nemeopsis, Nemeopsis is that comb jelly. When Chrysara is really high in abundance, they essentially consume these guys, and when their numbers are low, Nemeopsis responds. At the same point, when Nemeopsis is really high, things like copepod abundance, um, or when, when Nemeopsis is low, copepods are very high, um, and the reverse is true. So we see this really nice trophic cascade in the, in the Chesapeake, and that's kind of what we were expecting to see. Um, um, in our results that you're going to have this same sort of pattern. Um, and sure enough, if you just compare the, the two uh, species that up in here, this is sort of north to south in our gradations. In that highly developed northern area, we get huge numbers of these sea nettles, and at the same point, Nemeopsis is essentially excluded. It's not excluded, it's eaten. It's completely lost from the systems up there. So we have sort of this uh, tale of two bays. Um, and so essentially, when these guys are up, so we know that we've got this real strong top-down effect that the, the, that the sea nettles have on Nemeopsis. However, when we ask this question, does it result in that same sort of trophic cascade that we see in the Chesapeake, the answer is no. You know, so if we look at this response, yes, so as these Nemeopsis, as soon as Chrysara comes up, Nemeopsis sort of, you know, crashes down. Um, when we look at the difference between Nemeopsis and copepods, um, copepods actually peak after Nemeopsis peaks in the spring. So they are no way controlling that population. But when we actually plot sea nettles and copepods, as that goes up, these guys are taking them out. So they become sort of a more generic predator within the system. So they eat whatever's available. So Nemeopsis is gone, great. I'll switch to whatever's there. So they have proven to be relatively opportunistic in their distribution. So we don't see that uh, trophic cascade. So this is all happening in 2012. We can demonstrate all of these processes. Then in October of 2012, this little storm comes through our particular area and, and really wallops the Mid-Atlantic and, and New Jersey, New York in particular. Um, and, and part of what we do, and we can look at this, is that you know we had sur uh, storm surges anywhere between 11 uh, to 13 feet. Now, you know you guys are kind of normal to that because hurricanes are a regular process down here, um, and you've had to deal with your own island breaches, et cetera. But for the coastal mid-Atlantic, this is a really s extreme event to come through. Um, so this is not an, uh, an atypical position. Um, what you can notice right here, you see that 719? That's the address of the house. 
Okay, so they were going through, when the structural engineers are going through and trying to document what's actually out there, spray painting what remained of what should have been the lot number. Um, but there's no house, but uh, his boat is uh, happily displayed alongside there. And one of the big things that it did is on the northern part of the bay, we actually have this really big breach in the island, and all of a sudden we've got this big flushing uh, associated with that. Now, when you bring in humans into the mix of things, how long did that breach last? As quickly as the Army Corps could get and fill that sucker in, it did. Now, normally what should happen with all of our barrier islands is this is a natural process. That breach should have been there. It would exchange the flow rates and you build ups of, of materials kind of change, but, but we don't do that. We immediately filled that back in. Um, it, uh, on, on a subsequent nor'easter after it was filled in, it breached again, um, and they put a 30 foot. Um, 30 foot deep steel seawall here down into the ground um, and on several occasions when we've had other big nor'easters it's exposed 12 to 14 feet of that wall that they've had to since refill with sand so something happened offshore that funnels the water right in that area and it's just another matter of time before that breach is um, pretty s significant so if we look at sort of what happens a tale of, of two systems 2012 before the hurricane came and then beyond what we see is with our sea nettle populations essentially they decline really significantly. And, and much of that is that the polyp habitat, docks, uh, bulkheads, we've got all of this material that's been destroyed, it's been thrown out, so the reservoirs of polyps are gone. Um, so what does that do to the rest of the organisms? So Nemeopsis, which is this home jelly that's got these big effects, um, lo and behold, post Sandy shows this uh, big increase in its relative densities. Um, but then you know, we get this, and the, the question is, is why is there this big significant decline in 2014? I mean, the, 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 their major predator's not there anymore. It's still really depressed. So what's actually causing this? This was a, a really strange kind of a uh, issue. Um, lo and behold, when that top predator is taken out of the system, all of a sudden the diversity of all different other types of jellies in the system starts to rebound as well. And in the 2013, I'm, I'm going to move this up there, that big bar, these were oceanic salps that were now being pushed into the bays. So is a salp a single creature or is it a colony of hundreds? Um, so if we actually just sort of like ignore that fact that every little unit is at one or is it part of a whole, what we see is that over the following two years we actually get this big increase in the diversity of other jellies. So that list on the far right are all different kinds of gelatinous zooplankton. So with the removal of the top predator we actually see blooms of all these other species that really have been suppressed for uh, years while the, the sea nettles were dominant within the system. And we can actually sort of plot out what our communities look like um, in, in principal component analysis where, you know, in 2012, the driving factor up here are these sea nettles. Um, our 2013 is really driven by these huge numbers of salps that are oceanic. They shouldn't be in the back bays that are coming in. So we know that we've got differences in, in tidal fluctuations. Um, and then in, in 2014, we really get this big scattering, but it's, you know, a whole bunch of new species that are really contributing to what the community actually looks like. So uh, in, in terms of what were the overall impacts of, of the hurricane, um, that destruction of the habitat really limited the population of sort of the apex predator within that system. And then we start to see these increases in, in the diversity of other organisms. And so we really see this big shift in what the pelagic community actually looks like. So now we're going to actually get to what I'm here to talk about, which is sort of like changes and things. Um, for all the students out there, going to meetings is your greatest opportunity to learn stuff and take new directions. So um, we went to the Jellyfish Symposium in Barcelona in 2016 um, to present findings from a, a couple of different uh, pieces of work that we're going through. Talked to Larry Maiden at Woods Hole, and he was asking, have we ever seen this little thing called a clinging jellyfish in New Jersey? Because we've got grass beds, we've got all the right kind of habitat. I'm like, I've been working in these beds for almost 20 years, I've never seen when I, I, and we're doing jellyfish now. I've never, ever heard of them. Um, so we get back from that in the, the first week of June, and um, our intention is to go look for it. And gosh darn it, this guy right here, fisherman all his life, sees something really strange in the water, scoops it up, gives it to the local aquarium, and they call us, and there it is. So what we had just talked about at this international meeting looking for actually came to us. 
and it was kind of a big deal. Um, and you know, this is a NBC reporter here coming out to talk to us about these things and these new finds. So it, it kind of found us. Um, so this is this little guy here. It's called Gani Nemus Bertens. Um, he's very, very cute. This is actually one that's very filled. He's got a larval fish in its gut right there. Um, that's, that's the head of the fish inside of it. So we know that these guys are also big predators. We just don't know what they do. Um, it, it's called the clinging jelly because it's got modified tentacles that actually hold on to things like eelgrass and seagrass blades or vegetation. It's what they do. You can see them right here. He's holding on to some artificial seagrass ribbons. Um, they're native to the Pacific, but they've been known in the Mediterranean for uh, over a hundred years. And there's some really fascinating stories about uh, these guys um, from that particular area. So we, we've seen them up in this Manasquan was the first one, but we've uh, found them in other places. They're relatively small. Um, here's the big port. They're extremely venomous. They're nasty little critters, despite their size. Um, so we get back. We're dealing with this thing. We get emergency funding from the state uh, for a couple of reasons. One, we're able to identify and sort of confirm it through molecular analyses. Um, but then we also get to the first person that gets stung by one of these guys. And this kid spends two days in the hospital on a morphine drip. And essentially, the way it, he explained it to me is if you know what a Charlie horse is, when your muscle tightens and it won't release, imagine your entire body doing that. And that's what he was talking about. Um, I subsequently uh, went up and met with a guy in Connecticut who got stung by one. Um, he was immediately medevac to Yale Hospital um, because I thought he was having a massive heart attack because he got stung somewhere up in here. And the, the, the venoms aff affiliated with paralysis are just so potent in this thing that basically he was getting kind of shut down. Um, and in some cases, when we look at sort of the effects, uh, there's evidence of things like liver fi failure and kidney failure of people that have been stung by these. Um, and again, those are two places in your body that you get rid of toxins and nasty things in your system biologically. So uh, we, we've, we've found them, we've ID'd them. Um, we started playing around. Now, some of you guys might know um, these as artificial seagrass units. Some of you might have used them or seen them used at the Sea Lab. Some of them are mine still are in use here. Um, but we actually put these guys out there and uh, we've actually had active recruitment onto them by these jellyfish to kind of take a look at. Um, and, and we made some really fascinating things. Um, just like I talked about that Aquora, um, which is also a hydrozoan, these guys also are fluorescent. And that's a really unusual thing. And their spectral signals are different than the GFPs, uh, which means that we've got somebody who's looking at whether or not we can isolate the specific proteins, um, because you might be able to create new molecular markers uh, to use that uh, fluoresce in different areas and are excited. So you can do sort of multiplexing is what's referred to. Um, and then, lo and behold, I get good news and bad news. So. Um, this is a night adventure we've got out there. These are sea nettles up in this area, and um, they're all over the place in the places that we are finding these really high concentrations of uh, these gonionemus, these, these clean jellies. Um, and here it is. Uh, sea nettles eat them. So i had been spending the last five years trying to figure out how to get rid of them, and lo and behold, they eat them. And what we learned from a lot of the diet analysis is that uh, sea nettles, um, yeah, they got this real strong uh, uh, top down, but they do two things. They actively swim into seagrass beds and drag their tentacles through them, going through and picking up polychaetes, amphipods, isopods, fish, anything that they can come through. They actively swim to the bottom and drag their tentacles in the mud. Um, trying to grab at organisms. And so one of the things that we've actually come about from some of this work is that we might see this really strange benthic pelagic coupling. Typically we think of jellyfish sort of feeding in the water column and then when they die all their carbon everything sinks to the bottom. It's not been discussed the fact that maybe there's this other pathway going from the bottom coming up because these predators are mobilizing uh, stuff that's, that's down there. Um, so in, in our molecular confirmation of a lot of our diet analysis stuff, we found them eating uh, sea anemones and all kinds of benthic organisms that they shouldn't be eating, um, sea cucumbers, all this really strange stuff that can only happen while they're dragging their tentacles through uh, the mud resources. So what I'm going to show you right here is you can see here's a little sea nettle. 
this is a little clinging jelly, and after a period of time, there he is uh, inside. Um, but even more fun is when you throw him under the fluorescent uh, microscope, you can see some really cool things. So again, here's our little sea nettle with his little tentacles. There's this little nice cross. There's our little um, uh, clinging jelly inside the guts. Um, what we're trying to do now is to see if we might be able to turn this into um, some way to understand actually jellyfish digestion because you can see as he's being broken down this is parts of the clinging jelly that literally are being translocated through the mesoglea of the jellyfish we don't know how jellyfish actually digest stuff we know that there's a gastrovascular cavity food comes in it's kind of digested and it's distributed but it's really hard once it's turned into sort of protoplasm goo to actually follow it throughout there so we're trying to use this sort of fluorescence uh, capabilities here about it um, so uh, I've, I've had to give these talks to um, the general public where I talk about hooray for sea nettles yes I've been trying to kill them for five years we've got funding to look at different approaches to getting rid of polyps and lo and behold they might actually do something good for the public because I'd much rather be stung by a sea nettle than one of the clean jellies any day of the week now I've stung myself with most things intentionally or unintentionally including Portuguese man of war um, I've chosen not to test my luck on these um, just because I don't want to know uh, although there is a formula to uh, sting no more which is supposed to maybe work for them I'm unwilling to take that uh, risk at that point so when we see this new invasion again this is just 2016 that this thing shows up so just you know less than two years ago um, it, it started to get us uh, into some broader questions. So looking at distributions along the East Coast, because we know that they are uh, all along there, um, what is the origin of the population? So we're looking at sort of population genetics through multiple markers to try to get at where did this guy in New Jersey, because it doesn't fit in with some of the other known populations along the East Coast. Uh, recruitment dynamics, we don't know where the polyps are at all. Uh, trophic interactions, this is a stickleback that's uh, larger than the jelly, but he's managed to capture it and it, so we don't even know what role um, these guys actually play in the community. And it really started to lead to this idea about what else is out there. And that's where we get to the, the title of this talk, the Ellis Island Effect, as, as I refer to it. Um, so, you know, when you think about sort of uh, what was happening in the United States for a long part of our time, um, I, I'm not sure that this rings true with our current um, government in charge that we're willing and able to bring in those who are downtrodden, homeless, etc. Um, but the promise is that this is a great place to be. And so we see these really mass uh, migrations, and it doesn't matter how you look at it, um, we get this really big migration out of um, uh, sort of Central Europe um, over the last uh, several hundred years, and, and in particular, um, really starting in the late 1860s into the you know the, the early 1900s, we see these big distributions from you know Northern Europe early, and then we start to see this Southern Europe um, uh, distribution coming through of, of people and immigrants, and, and in particular, what something near and dear to my heart, which is this large group um, in the late 18 to early 1900s that were immigrating from Italy including those two folks that happens to be my grandfather and grandmother along with my dad on a on a decent day of fishing back in the 50s um, alongside there and and the reason I say that this Italian immigration is, is kind of interesting to the story is that a lot of the species that we're starting to identify all have Mediterranean origins so if we look at potentials of invasion pathways, certainly we know that ship holes and fouling have been a dominant area uh, that has allowed uh, non-native species to get into new areas. So when we look at uh, fouling of ship holes um, starting, you know, hundreds, five, six hundred years ago, they were bringing over all different kinds of uh, different types of organisms. Um, we know that the ballast, both solid and water, so now most ships use water as ballast, but in the olden times they would just pick up rocks in the local area, put them in, and then when they got to the new area they would throw them over. Many times they were sort of right along the coastline, so we brought a lot of non-native species and ballast that kind of survived on those rock ballasts as they came across there. And certainly fishing and plastic debris have been a big contributor 
contributor um, to invasive species, uh, opening canals, um, accidental releases, aquaculture have also transferred. Um, in, in this area, uh, this is Halophila stipulacea. It's taking over the tropics in the Caribbean at an incredible rate um, in terms of its massive spread. Um, so this is actually one of the species that I work with down in the tropics as well. Um, sort of theoretically potentially displacing a lot of native seagrass species in the Caribbean. So if we think about invasion biology, if they're really big items, it's really easy to see. Big animals are easy to see, big plants are easy to see, and you can see them from a distance. So uh, surprisingly, even though that's only an inch, um, that's still relatively large and you can see them. So part of our, 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 our quest has been, well, what about small cryptic species? How is it that we can find and identify these that are out in the water? And so uh, there's a lot of different methods that we can do and, and that might work. So we've used a lot of settling plates. We've used fluorescence to try to identify organs organisms to see whether or not they do fluoresce. That helps us kind of move them in different pathways. And then one of the big things that we've really been involved in are, are different molecular approaches to ask the question, are there different things out there that we don't know about? So um, in terms of broad scale molecular approaches, one is just sequencing unknowns. I don't know what it is. I can tell what file it is. So then at least I can, you know, got some group that I can go through and sort of targeted um, uh, analysis of, of, of known sequences, 16S, uh, CO1, 28S, these different mitochondrial markers that may be out there allow us to do it. Um, there's also the approach, you might have heard of sort of barcoding, which is you take a big sample, deep sequence it, and do a lot of high-end bioinformatics, and we come out with what's there. Um, and then something that we've been working on, this idea of um, let the predators actually find the prey. And I'll talk about our, our friendly little neuterbrank here in just a minute. So let's go back to this first invasive, this um, uh, Ghanianemus, which is the first one we found just a couple years ago. Um, its native range is in the Pacific, however, it's really got this strong Mediterranean key from the 1920s and earlier. So we know that it was invited already in those places, and that's one of the potential pathways that it comes through. Um, highly venomous, really nasty little guy, and let me tell you, it is an extremely beneficial to live in New Jersey when you have both New York and Philadelphia. Philadelphia television markets. And when NBC in New York gets your story, they run it at five, and then Philly runs that same story at six. Um, in the month of July of 2016, I probably was doing anywhere between four and seven media interviews a week. And in some cases, they would have, CBS would show up to interview us, and then, you know, half hour later, ABC would show up. Um, and so we even made it into the New York Times um, about this little guy in a rapid period because of sort of the, the fluctuation. And, and the reality is, is that because it really poses a serious health risk of people that were out there um, that might get stung by it. There was a, a tremendous amount of media that came came with it. Um, so after we saw this, we're like, well, we got all these old settling plates still in jars. So this is the other uh, piece of evidence or, or piece of um, wisdom to depart on all of you uh, students that are out there. Um, keep your old samples. You never know when they might come through. So we were going through jars of old settling plates preserved in ethanol, uh, desperately looking for uh, the polyps of these little teeny uh, clean jellies. Now, we didn't find any. However, we did manage to come up with these little three things. And these are, you know, a millimeter in size. These are really, really small, teeny polyps. You can see that these are the end, um, uh, these are the tentacles, this is their basal disc where they attach. These are actually medusa buds that are bumping out of these. And so we've got all these really small things. What the hell are they? So we've got warm bodies, um, so now it's time to, to analyze them. And so what we really started to do is we'd already developed all these cnidarian primers for a lot of our jellyfish data, was just applying them into these situations and letting them actually go. And so in this case, you know, we've got isolations, you extract the DNA, you amplify it, you sequence it, you do all those other kinds of things, and I'll tell you right now, I didn't do any of this. This is where your colleagues and your students are really, really useful, because they did all of this work, and then they come back and they tell me, and I get to tell these really cool stories, um, but they do all the hard work. 
And so um, when we go through there, lo and behold, these two polyps right here come up with this unknown uh, Mauricia species um, that has been known to invade all different kinds of places around the planet. Um, but here's the problem with it is really unresolved taxa because it's so small, it's so cryptic. Um, even the taxonomic experts at the Smithsonian have samples and they can't figure out, they, they can't classify it, the species. So we end up finding this, uh, the, the species within the, you know, again, we've got sort of 100% match with ones in California and Virginia. Um, we don't necessarily know its, its native origin, but the two closest species, which are Mauricia incremonica and Mauricia lyoncia, um, both have uh, Mediterranean origins and pathways of where they are known um, locally. Number three, this new Aquora. Aquora is this one that's also a fluorescent species, um, not this one, um, but we find this polyp right in here, extremely tiny from 2014, and then lo and behold in 2017, last summer, we actually get adults of them showing up in our plankton, so we know we've got sort of a robust population. Um, at this point, we're really close in terms of sort of 96% match in terms of the, the, the genetic information to this Aquora australis, which is a, a Pacific one, but it's at 96%. If it's at 99%, even 98%, I'd be willing to call it. So either we have sort of an unknown species or we've got this Pacific invasive that's also in our area that we've just never, ever observed. Nobody's ever seen it before. Um, and then this little bugger. This is where, you know, we find things. I can tell it it's a bougainville. It's hard to see right here. He's in this little, this is actually... Um, a molecular tube that's about that big, so this guy's only about a millimeter or two in size. Um, so you can see his nice little cross and his sort of the open part of the bell. Um, we come through and we actually get this really nice hit, 96% um, out of Croatia for this particular species, um, Bougainvillea uh, uh, triestina, triestina. Um, who, in and amongst itself, has had a hard time becoming its own species um, and has always been considered sort of a smaller version of other species in there, and it's just finally becoming recognized. But this is another, you know, Mediterranean species. Um, so uh, essentially we think that we've found in just the last um, year and a half four different sort of invasive species that we've never seen before. Um, now here's the last part that, that I'm going to talk about. Um, Nudimeranks, really interesting, and this actually led us to finding a couple of different things. Um, Nudibranchs feed on the polyps of cnidarians, and in particular they're after their nematocysts. They can take the nematocysts, the stinging cells, translocate them, stick them on their back in these uh, serrata right in here, and essentially they sort of coat the edges of themselves with these stinging cells. So if a nosy fish comes and says, oh, isn't that a juicy little morsel, and they go to attack them, they get a face full of nematocysts that sting them, so it's an, it's an act of um, uh, predation deterrent that they do this. And so um, we figured, and correctly so, that if we take these guys and we crush them up and extract the DNA and then we use cnidarian primers, you know, something built for, you know, jellyfish, that potentially if those cells are still intact that they're actually going to amplify and we ought to be able to get a read and theoretically it's not only sort of what they've got in their guts but it's also a long-term record of what they've been feeding on and uh, a big part of this is that um, in so many cases, we have no idea where the polyp stages of a lot of these different species actually are. But these are a lot easier to see than necessarily those sort of uh, millimeter and less size polyps. And so we, you know, we run it under those same uh, patterns. And, and lo and behold, um, what do we find? Um, Obelia is a, is a hydrozoan, but it's extremely common. It's a native in our area. Um, but the same Mauricia, it's feeding in our area on these things and it shows up in the DNA. So we actually were able to extract that. Now here's a couple of other strange ones. All these things in blue, these are nudibranchs that come up in the system. Um, there's some evidence that uh, there are these nudibranchs that feed on algae and they steal the chloroplast and essentially they've, this viral vector process, have translocated um, 
uh, chloroplast DNA into their DNA because they're able to replicate and maintain the chloroplast in their system and then they essentially photosynthesize. So after they've consumed this, they can just continue to grow and live and they become photosynthetic. So there's evidence for those that they either have undergone sort of lateral gene transfer. Um, and, and certainly when we start to see some of these matches for the, the Tolinas here at 99%, that we use Nidarian markers to match into that, that there's the potential that there's some lateral gene transfer happening between some of the hydrozoans or some of these Nidarians and the predators that are out there. Because when they grab the cells that are stinging cells, they try to get and harvest immature. So somehow they've got to tell those nematocysts to mature to full before they stick them on their backs. So there's got to be some uh, cellular direction um, that tells those cells that they need to mature and that they need to kind of become fully. And so one way is either that they keep the cells alive sufficiently to let it to go or that they have their own cellular mechanisms to release um, uh, molecular signals for them to mature and stay within there. So we still have lots and lots of sort of unresolved species that are out there. Um, in this case, this is a little polyp. He fluoresces. It's hard to see. These are um, a, a polyp. Uh, what we think is um, a, a, a small polyp as well. Um, again, this is a, a millimeter. So this thing is like a half a millimeter in size. These are two of our unknown um, really small jellies that are, are in the process of, of being sequenced. So we have no idea on how many more species we may come up with and sort of this approach in terms of what's native. Um, and so I'll finish up here with, uh, you know, yes, uh, we were in our younger days part of the Kenny Corbett, Kenny's All-Star Band back in the uh, 90s. Um, and then uh, this is uh, the illustrious Dr. Heck on stage with the Dive and Ducks at the Benthic Ecology meetings. And then uh, Ken and John, which really uh, gave me an opportunity to come here and to love this place and have a great time studying. And uh, with that, I will take, that, that, that's, that's the money that he got for the ride. If you've not heard the story about the ride, um, it's a good one, and I'm, I'm willing to answer that question, but possibly after we go to the question modes, and it won't be forever preserved. Am I supposed to turn this one off? Yeah, turn it off.